At any rate, Cynthia, uh, glad to have you back on the show. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, I've been excited. I was actually telling my 16 year old a little bit about you when we were driving back from lacrosse practice and he knew exactly what your documentary was about and had listened to the podcast we did together. And so, so it's good to know that you are making an impact even in the future generations. You know, my teenager knows exactly who you are and the work that you do. That makes me feel good because, you know, I often wonder, I was having this conversation. I'm going to name drop now, but the show just came out today. I was on Mike Rowe's podcast and, um, you know, they, they were talking to me about, um, you know, you know, man, you know, you're out there and you're fighting this good fight and the whole thing. Do you feel like there's a target on your back? And it's like, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I know there's a target on my back because I get death threats. <laughs> so, you know, but when you, you know, as they say, either, you know, you stand for something, or you fall for nothing, or you fall for anything is the other way of, and you, 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 we make choices in life, you know, you, you know, the bottom line is, I don't have to do this podcast. I don't really need this. And, you know, people go, why do you do it? Why do you do any of it? And it's because and this is not bullshit. Maybe it maybe it sounds that way. Maybe it does seem like bullshit. But you know, I care, you know, I, it, you know, you do you have to do something in life. Look, I have a vitamin company, a coffee company, a foods company, I can just go do that all day, and never do this. Right? I'm busy enough. But I make time to do this five days a week, because I think this is worth it. And when I think of, you know, Cynthia, I think, well, wait, this woman's a nurse practitioner. She, you know, she has kids at home. Why is she writing books? What, what, what is she, what, what's your why, Cynthia? Why, why are you doing any of this? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think some of your listeners may or may not know this. So six years ago on April 1st, uh, it was six years ago that I walked away from clinical medicine largely because I was frustrated with our broken system and was tired of writing prescriptions. My whole background is ER medicine and cardiology. And I wrote a lot of prescriptions and I kept seeing reoccurring patterns. And I kept feeling as if my hand, I was constrained, you know, at the time nurse practitioners were not autonomous in our great state that we live in. And I was mitigated by decision-making capabilities that were beyond what I was really able to do. And so every time I suggested we should really talk to our patients about nutrition and not just hand them a sheet and tell them to go on their merry way and use Brummel and Brown and canola oil spreads instead of using butter and don't, you know, bastardize fats. And so I was really having a, uh, a moment where I wanted to make a larger impact. And so I leapt out of bed in February of 2016, gave my notice my very last day of work as a conventional nurse practitioner was April 1st. My poor husband, I had no business plan. I just said, I'm going to be successful. And whether or not that was confidence or stupidity, I'm not sure. But almost instantaneously, I started attracting a woman uh, that was very similar to what I was experiencing in my early 40s, um, in many ways feeling like our experiences were not being validated. And uh, you know, we would have conventional physicians uh, generally telling me that this is just the way things are. Maybe you're going to be five or 10 pounds heavier at this stage of your life. And I just said, this can't be the way. And so that turned into creating programs and doing one-on-one -on -one work. And then I got a crazy idea in 2018 that as an introvert, I wanted to do a TED talk because I, I, I had seen someone talk about how they had did a lot of philanthropy with the things that came from a successful TED talk. And I said, I'd really like to do that. And so I did my first in December of 2018 and did my second in March of 2019. And that changed everything. And so that talk went viral and I became known as the person that was talking about fasting and women and almost instantaneously it blew my business up. My team and I were not prepared for what was coming. And that turned into me feeling like I was in a position where I really needed to invest more in my business to grow. And so I joined a mastermind and, and through a series of decisions, I just kept making the right decision and the next right leap and the next right leap. And that led to 
growing my podcast, which is something I've, I've really grown to love. It's probably one of my favorite things in my business. And uh, that then led to the opportunity to uh, write a book. And I'd always said like, I might write a book one day. But what I really started to realize is women desperately wanted and needed a resource for intermittent fasting because we are not many men. And there's a lot about our physiology that makes us incredibly unique. And I said, you know, we need to stop apologizing for the fact that we have you know, so much hormonal flux day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, until women go through menopause. And so long story short, I wrote a book, the book just came out. And for me, the reason why I do this is I genuinely want to help and serve people. That's why I became a nurse and later a nurse practitioner. And now I get to do it on a different level. I get to connect with people by a podcast. People can connect with a book. And so I feel very, very fortunate. Um, one thing that I think is important is that in 2019, I spent 13 days in the hospital and only got out 27 days before that second talk, that second TED talk. And I told myself that if I lived through that experience and got out of the hospital and got home to my family, that I would never be afraid and I would never, ever, ever be hesitant to take risks. And obviously I've been making a lot of quote unquote, safe, risky decisions, but they've obviously been the right ones because I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. And it's the thing that's amazing for me is that with each one of these big changes that's happened, I feel like I'm evolving and growing into a bigger person. Meaning I just feel like there's a lot that I used to focus on that I don't even worry about anymore. I'm so laser focused on my key priorities, which are my family and being able to impact more, especially women's lives and, you know, spread a message of hope because I, nothing makes me more frustrated than, you know, the toxic diet industry that convinces women that we're supposed to exercise constantly, restrict our food, not live a fulfilling life. And instead I want to teach people about sustainable strategies, things that don't require people to feel like they live in a existence of lack if you will, because I, I think for a lot of women, they're, they're, they are a slave to their scale. They are a slave to counting calories and they are a slave to the treadmill because they seem to think that those three things are going to uh, better, best serve their needs. And, and I'll be the first person to say that they can be incredibly destructive. And, um, you know, I just think we need to change the narrative. It's like, let's create sustainable strategies that people can do that don't involve a potion, a pill or a powder, because isn't that the basis of the diet industry is convincing uh, absolutely. people of the next great thing. Like this one product's going to save you. It's going to get, make you lose 15 pounds in a week and fit into your, you know, jeans that you wore in high school <laughs> as an example. Well, I, I, there's so much to unpack here. Um, I, I talked about this when you were on before, and I will mention it again, folks, you may not know what a nurse practitioner is. Um, these people are many doctors. She said women are not many men, uh, but they are many doctors. Um, stop me when I'm wrong, Cynthia, but they are allowed to prescribe medication. Mm -hmm. um, they see patients. Um, they are doing the work of a doctor when the doctor can't walk in. So when back in 20, what did you say 27? Because 2019 is when you got sick. 2017 is when you decided to walk away. 2016, yep. you decided to walk away. Uh, if you're working for a, a cardiologist, obviously you're handing out statins and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And people, I think when people hear me say this, it's like, oh, there, there's some hyperbole there, there's a little bit conjecture, well, the guy goofs around a lot, maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about. But um, I talk to doctors all the time, I don't make this stuff up. I want it to come from the mouth of someone who is writing those scripts. Um, I have people calling me constantly saying, Hey, um, I just got back from my doctor. Uh, and it's a GP, it's not, you know, because I'll ask you, know, I just got back from my GP, they, they did my cholesterol test. They say I have high cholesterol, and they want to put me on a, a statin uh, right away. And I booked this consult with you. What say you and the first thing I tell them is, well, I'm not a doctor, and I cannot give you medical advice. Um, I'm going to have you tell me what your numbers are, and then I will not comment on those numbers, but I would like to hear them. 
And they would give me, I would ask for the total, I would ask for the breakdown of LDL and ACL. And then knowing the truth, I'll go, what was your particle test? Did, did they do a particle test? What's that? Where's that? Oh, it should be there. Your doctor didn't do a particle test? Uh, no, I don't see anything here. I see bun and Billy Rubin. No, no, that's, that's not cholesterol. Let's go back, go, go up a little bit. No, no particle test, small dense particles, anything. No, 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 no doctor didn't do that. Uh, did you fast before you went in for that test? And I will get 50 50 on that. Really? Uh, yeah, some people will say, No, I ate that morning. Oh, they didn't tell me anything about fasting. That happened to me. I went in because I'm here now in Central Virginia. And Serena goes, you need to have a GP, I go in and they do this battery of tests. And uh, they call me back in and they, <laughs> they, they go, all of your tests, you know, your, your triglycerides, my triglycerides said they were 40. 40. Awesome. And they, um, um, my blood sugar was 80. And everything was just great, right? And they knew what my calcium score was because, you know, they had all of my records right there. At mine, I'm going to brag, I'm almost 60, zero. Um, awesome. So I had a zero. And uh, they're looking at all this stuff. And when she calls me up to give me the over the phone, I'm driving my car and she goes, um, yeah, everything is great. But um, we have to put you on a statin. I'm like, oh, what? what, what, what? Oh, yeah, your cholesterol was too high. Your overall number was too high. And I was like, my overall number. And she goes, Yeah, your total cholesterol was whatever. It wasn't even in the 200s or it was right at 200. She goes, your HDL and your LDLs are perfect. And I said, Yeah, and she goes, Yeah, we need to put you on the statin. And I said, Well, what was my um, what was my um, particle score? And she goes, Oh, we don't we don't do that. Well, you're gonna put me on a drug? And you don't know what my particle small dose particles, you no idea. She goes, No, we don't do that test. I said, Do you not do it because you don't know how to read it? And she goes, No, we don't do it here. I said, Why don't you do it? It's, you're putting me on a drug. And you're, you're putting me on a drug. And there's no reason to be on a drug. If you don't know why you're putting me on the drug. And she explained she didn't like my attitude, and I should find a new doctor. And <laughs> she fired me on the spot. Um, by the way, they never told me to fast that morning. Obviously, I went in there with a the triglyceride of 40 and blood sugar of 80. I did fast, but they didn't tell me to fast. They didn't know if I had fasted or not. No one told me to do that. They took a test, they took an incomplete test and wanted to put me on a drug that can cause other problems. I get the same thing from people. I talk to people five days a week. You can book a phone call with me at vinnytotteries.com five days a week. You would be shocked at how many of those phone calls are because people are scared shitless over a, you know, a cholesterol statin test. And what I do is I go, listen, I'm not, you know, you told me what the numbers are. You're not going to die. Do not take my word for it. I'm not a doctor. There's a guy named Trocolasian. There's a guy, if you're in California, I send them to Brett Shear. If they're around uh, North Carolina, I send them over to um, uh, Dr. Eric Westman. I send them to every doctor I know, uh, Linsky. I send them to all of these doctors and go, go see this doctor. This doctor will do the test. And I'll ask them, calcium score? Well, I don't know. No calcium score, huh? No, 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 no. And they're putting you on a statin, right? I want your words before we get into your book, because now I'm mad, Cynthia. <laughs> I've just woke myself up into a tizzy. I need a drink already. Um, <laughs> when should someone be on a statin? You worked with a cardiologist. You handed out statins. When should someone be on a statin? Well, you need a clinical indication. So what that means is you need to have documented risk or you have documented cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, that's where the indication lies. Typically it's aspirin, so an antiplatelet along with a statin agent. And I used to tell my patients that the things that statins do is they reduce inflammation and they help with plaque stabilization. God forgive me, because I think about the fact that I just was that card carrying statin writer all the time. And I had this brilliant 
NIH researcher who was a patient and she had total cholesterol and LDL that were just through the roof. And she was tiny, petite, took good care of herself, just had you know this, this family history of high total cholesterol, high LDL. And so we initially did a VAP, you know, a, an advanced lipid analysis, looking at particle size, and we were looking at inflammatory markers and she taught me so much. I always, I always admit that there were patients throughout my career that taught me a lot, caused me to, to have a pause. And so this lovely woman explained why she would never take a statin. And then she talked about what happened cognitively when we took statin agents and when we got our total cholesterol too low. And then I started considering how many of my patients had low total cholesterols that were on high doses of statins, 40, 80 milligrams a day wow. that were dealing with side effects and their total cholesterol was under a hundred. Now this is a marker of morbidity and mortality. If your yeah. total cholesterol is that low, you're not making sex hormones. You have no libido. You might even have some degree of erectile dysfunction. Cause you probably have some, you probably have some vascular disease on top of it. And I, I, I kind of cringe because unless you have a very clear cut indication, and we used to put pre-diabetics and diabetics on statins, even without documented cardiovascular disease or vascular disease. And the whoa, amount whoa, whoa, of whoa. Don't, don't, don't go, don't go over that. Why do they, I, I hear that all the time where people will tell me I have type two diabetes. They put me on a statin. Yep. Why? Well, it, it doesn't artificially, it's not like metformin, is it? It's not going to artificially lower it, is it? Well, what's interesting is there's some research to suggest that certain types of statins will actually exacerbate your glucose sensitivity. So imagine you're a diabetic, you're put on a statin and it makes your diabetes worse. Wow. And so, you know, living in Northern Virginia, I had a lot of very intelligent patients that would come in and say, Cynthia, what do you think about this? And I would say, I, I need to do a little more reading. And so, you know, if anyone is, is being told, I use my mom as a good example, she's now retired, but she has a high LDL. She has some inflammatory markers that are up. Uh, her doctor immediately wanted to put her on a statin. She's vehemently opposed to a statin because I've educated her on some of the things you have to be concerned about. And a lot of it's cognitive function as well as, you know, depleting CoQ10 in the body. And then you're getting myalgias and muscle aches and who wants that? And so she went through um, a coronary CTA. She had very mild placking in, in her LAD, so her left anterior descending artery. And she said, what do you think they're going to do? And I said, I think they're going to put you on a statin. And so we're back to you know round one, but her yeah. particle size, here's the other thing. If your LDL is high, the first thing you need to ask your healthcare provider is for an LDL particle size, because you can have high LDL and have these light fluffy particles. And that is less atherogenic, meaning it is not likely to go on and create, uh, you know, placking in the arteries. Whereas if you have small dense particle size, that's more pathogenic. And so I think that's a, an important stepping point, stepping stone. The other thing is I worry far more about triglycerides and HDL because we know those are markers of metabolic inflexibility. So if your triglycerides are 300, and you're a male and your HDL is less than 45 or a woman less than 55, you got work to do. I'm far more worried about those markers and total cholesterol. I don't even think about, I just don't like to see it too low because if it's too low, you know, it can, it can be problematic. In fact, I remember being uh, yelled at once. I didn't get yelled at much over my career, but I got yelled at by a cardiologist who was frustrated that I lowered his patient's statin. And I said, his total cholesterol is a hundred. 100. And he says, he's 90 years old. What are we doing? Are we treating the patient or treating a number? Listen, I've had experts on this show, Cynthia, who have said that low cholesterol, low total cholesterol is uh, indicative of people who get cancer more mm -hmm. readily. And as I tell everyone on the phone, when I'm trying to calm them down, <laughs> Um, because I, I get it, man, that some doctor just scared the ever living crap out of them. And they're on the phone talking to you know me, mm -hmm. right? And I'll say to them, understand this. Um, cholesterol is um, a non-essential. And I'll say, do you know what that means? And they're going, I don't know, like a vitamin? Like, yeah, yeah, I kind of like a vitamin. 
there are 13 essential vitamins, and I'll explain that to them. So you know, those vitamins are essential because our body won't make them, we have to take them. If we don't get them, that, that's one of the problems I explained to vegans, look, you know, you be a vegan all day long, you need to get some iron. And you need to get yourself some B12. Mm -hmm. Or you're not gonna you, you, you're gonna go downhill even faster, you know, than you would even if you take those you're still not on a healthy diet, but at least you're closer. And I'll say <laughs> with cholesterol, it's a non essential, which means if you don't take it, your body will make it. That's how we that's how important it is to every cell in your body. We need cholesterol for our bodies to live to build our brain lives on it. Every cell in our body lives on it. That's that's how important it is. Our body will make it. It will make it. So if you don't take it, it's going to make it anyway. If you take a drug to lower something that your body craves, it makes zero sense. What say you? I agree. I mean, what people don't realize if we look at the cellular level, so we go all the way down to the cellular level, the, the cell wall is actually comprised of cholesterol. So you think about the fact that by the age of 40, most of us have some degree of mitochondrial dysfunction and the mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells. Speak for yourself, cell sister. I don't. <laughs> of course you don't. You're an outlier, just like I am. Grr, grr. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But when I think about when I'm talking to people just on a cellular level, we want to protect the quality of our cellular membranes. And I think it seems so intangible. People are like, yes, yeah, cells, whatever. I don't even think about it. But if you take an organ and you break down the organ and, and what, what a, an organ is comprised of is many, many, many cells, it's critically important to understand that if you don't have adequate cholesterol production, your, your, your cellular membranes are going to be leaky. You're not going to make sex hormones. Um, you're going to have, you know, it ups your risk for certain types of cancers. You have an increased risk of morbidity and mortality, and those are real risks. And so I, I, you know, try to explain over and over and over again, because I get panic messages from my female clients saying, my doctor wants to put me on a statin. And so I will point them in the direction of Dave Feldman's work, who I think is brilliant. We talk about lean hyper responders of which I am one, uh, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, helping to change the trajectory and the narrative about cholesterol management and synthesis is so, so important. There's explain, so much misinformation. Cynthia, I'm sorry, go back. I want you to explain to the audience, uh, explain to me like I'm in third grade, what a <laughs> hyper responder is, mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't understand it. Because yeah, there is a, a problem in the cholesterol world. Go. So when we think about lean hyper responders, they're thin individuals who have elevated LDL, elevated cholesterol. And for my entire adult life, I was always told when I had my lipids drawn, oh, you've got a problem, you need to be on a statin. And of course, I knew better. And I just said, can I please ask for particle size? And so it's interesting when we talk about these vehicles of transportation in the body, when we, when people go over sometimes to a more nutrient dense mm -hmm. whole foods diet, maybe a ketogenic diet, maybe their lower carb diet, you know, a no sugar, no grain diet, all of a sudden their body is acclimating to changes in nutritional paradigms. And so they have more vehicles to transport the cholesterol. And so, you know, I know that Dave Feldman's doing a lot of tremendous research in this area, trying yeah. to proved to clinicians and he's an engineer. I always say the engineers, I'm married to an engineer. The engineers have such a unique way of thinking. They're very data driven. They're very quantitative driven. And so he's running um, research right now, research protocols to try to get more information to explain why do some people just make more cholesterol in response to whether it's genetic susceptibilities, meaning things that we inherit, or is it related to dietary changes? Because I think most of us think of lipid problems or cholesterol problems in the obese population. And this isn't a population of people that are metabolically healthy, but are creating a lot of transportation boats. Like Dave does a really great job with these analogies and these transportation boats of cholesterol that are ferrying around LDL particles throughout the body. What's interesting is, uh, you know, when I, when I talked to him for the podcast, I kept saying, it's so validating to know <laughs> that there are other people like me out there 
because if I had listened to what I had been told throughout my lifetime, I would have been on a statin for 20 years. Yeah. You know, and I look at my, my father who uh, is, you know, lean hyper responder and he's been on a statin and I think it's really, uh, you know, it's gotten to a point and this is sad. Um, his cognitive function is really declined and he was always a very smart person. So from a third grade high level level, it's really, it's just one piece of the puzzle. When we're looking at a lipid panel, it's a bit of information. We need more. If your lipid panel's pristine, great. If it's not pristine, if it's high triglycerides with a low HDL, we know how to fix that. And a lot of it's lifestyle medicine. If you have high LDL, the first thing I would ask for is ask for a VAP. We used to call it a VAP. It's probably called something else now, advanced lipid analysis, depending on which lab you use, it's probably something different, but it's looking at particle size. It's looking at what is your threshold for the type of LDL cholesterol your body is making? Is it just light and fluffy? Like I always think of happy clouds, like it's light and fluffy, like a balloon. It's kind of floating around. We don't really worry about that. Or is it dense and small? And we know that that type of cholesterol, excuse me, that type of LDL cholesterol is pathogenic or has the propensity to be pathogenic. And so I always say we need a little bit more information. And so if I were talking to a third grader, that's what I would say. Think about boats. Think about the boats are faring extra cholesterol around the body. We need more information. It's not a definitive uh, indication for a statin. And by the way, you know, when people say to me, go, you've had so many people on this Friday show, you know, that, you know, who's, who's the smartest, you know, you know, you, you, you William Davis, you've had, you know, uh, Lustig, you've had Perlmutter, you've had, um, I, I'll just tell them, you know, um, Ivor Cummins, Dave Feldman. And they'll go, oh, who, who are they? I was like, engineers. Yeah, they're, I mean, it's scary. They're, they're two of the smartest one. people. Yeah, so, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's crazy what those guys have done in the medical community, and they're not medical doctors. And I've had every, as a matter of fact, I introduced um, Dave Feldman to um, my friend, uh, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time I had Dave on the show, it was when I was still living in LA, <clears throat> Drew says, I want you to come in with him. And I was like, why is that, Drew? He goes, I, I, I just come in with him. I, I need some backup in case, you know, this guy. I went, he, Drew, he could come in by himself. I went in for that first interview and just sat there. I introduced Dave to Drew and just sat there for the next hour and let him talk. I think Dave, I think Dave Feldman has been on Drew's podcast twice since then. Mm -hmm. Drew doesn't give me a call mm -hmm. anymore for that. He, he, <laughs> he is all about Dave Feldman. And everybody I introduced Feldman to, they love that guy. You know, they, they just want to be part of, of that. Yeah. He's so, smart um, and humble. Yeah. Um, I want to switch gears a bit and get into fasting. Uh, people ask me about it all the time. Um, I'll send them over to uh, Dr. Jason Fung. Mm -hmm. um, he, Jason's a guy who I feel like I broke on the internet and he was doing it before me. I was like the first podcast. I think he was on 10 years ago. Um, you know, I brought him on and, you know, I, you know, I, I know that uh, Trochalasian talks a lot about mm -hmm. fasting and, and uh, all those guys. Uh, but fasting in women, uh, that, that's, it's not new. People have been doing it. Hell, there are places in Russia where people go and they fast cancer away. And there's, all, you know, you hear of all this incredible stuff. What do we need to know? And at some point, I don't want to forget this because it's in my mind now. I get asked about the dawn effect all the time mm -hmm. when it comes to fasting and the blood sugar going up. If you have any brand new knowledge on that, let's let's talk about that too. So I'm just going to give you the floor. Uh, <laughs> let us know what's in the book and yep. um, tell people, g g give us a background. Let us yeah. know. Sell me on this book. Absolutely. Well, I can tell you that uh, Dr. Jason Fung, I respect enormously. What a humble, wonderful person he is. Uh, probably about seven years ago, I read the complete guide to fasting and that gave me the courage to, uh, believe that fasting was actually well-researched and, and certainly a reasonable option for me personally. And so life comes full circle and Jason actually wrote an endorsement that's on the back of the book, um, for which nice. I'm really grateful. So when I think about fasting and why we have to do it differently as women, it really speaks to the fact that we have to honor our physiology, meaning we're getting a menstrual cycle every month. You know, it's, it's important for women to understand that we can fast. I don't believe in the fear mongering. In fact, it's 
normally when I talk to Jason, it's almost always a topic that we touch on is how frustrating it is as a clinician to see, you know, fit pros out there. And it's no criticism of fit pros. They, maybe they don't know better, but to somehow demonize a strategy that dates back to biblical times to me seems silly. But when we talk about fasting in women, it's really leaning into our physiology. So as an example, when a woman is still cycling, um, and certainly in the peak fertile years, we have to be protective of when she's fasting in her menstrual cycle. And so if we look at a 28 day cycle, we've got the follicular phase, which is from the day you bleed until right before ovulation. And then you have a luteal phase after ovulation till bleed time. And I tell everyone that the follicular phase is when you're a rock star, you know, this is when estradiol or estrogen predominates and women can push their workouts. They can do lower carb or ketogenic diets. They can increase their fasting windows. And they really do have more insulin sensitivity. So there's a lot more buffering. Whereas in the luteal phase when progesterone predominates, and this is kind of the mellow hormone. This is the hormone that helps us sleep and reducing anxiety and depression. But it's also the hormone where we can't push it quite as hard. We don't want to do really long fast. We don't want to be really restrictive with our diets and our macros. And we need to change the type of physical activity we do. And so when we honor those things, understanding the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, we're rock stars. And then we have to back off a bit in the latter part of our menstrual cycle. That's really key, but I don't see a lot of people talking about that. And I think that's critically important. The other piece is that when women get late thirties, early forties, and they're entering perimenopause, this five to 10 years preceding menopause, menopause is 12 months without a menstrual cycle or reverse puberty. If we want to think about it that way, the playing field gets leveled again women all of a sudden are exquisitely sensitive to the amount of sleep they're getting. They can't do the same types of exercise. I'm going to pick on CrossFit for a second. There's nothing wrong with CrossFit, but if you're a 45 or 50 year old woman, and you're doing CrossFit five oh, days a oh, week. Cynthia, <laughs> there, there's a lot wrong with CrossFit. <laughs> we can get into that later. But yeah. Go on. Exercise. Yep. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the right types of exercise strength training is critically important for middle-aged women, the right type of nutrition. And that means anti-inflammatory nutrition. We're talking about, you know, gluten and dairy being two huge ones, alcohol, sugar, grains, depending on who you are as an individual. In fact, we become more physiologically insulin resistant, the closer we get to menopause. And this is when even thin women will start to struggle. They're like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I'm doing everything I used to do. And it's the cumulative impact of chronic stress. So I always say you have to dial in on sleep. You got to dial in on stress. You got to do the right type of exercise and you absolutely positively have to have an anti-inflammatory diet. And then women can really do well with, uh, you know, incorporating intermittent fasting into their perimenopausal years, menopause. This is when women don't have as much hormonal flux. And I will never compare women to men because we are our own unique beings. However, menopausal women and men generally have the easiest time provided that they're dialing on those lifestyle pieces. So what I talk about in the book, I talk about hormones. I talk about the science. I guide women through a 45 day program. I have a, you know, very protein centered menu in the back. Um, in fact, I'm cracking up cause I got one crappy review on Amazon cause someone was upset. I didn't have enough fish recipes. And I said, well, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Anna Vulcino, you should get with Anna Vulcino and you guys should talk. As a matter of fact, you should probably do her clubhouse. I'll talk to her off the air. Mm -hmm. You know, people will give her a bad review because there's just one recipe in there. They just didn't like, you know, it's like, she's got two cookbooks. I, I know where you, it, it, people are nuts. Yeah. Well, I got, I got a bad review on audible because someone said my voice, my voice made their cortisol levels go up. And I was like, okay. Okay. You know, you know, they can stop listening to you. And I just said, you know, I, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. That's uh, that's unfortunate. So it really gives women the, uh, the tools to be able to incorporate intermittent fasting and troubleshoot. And here's one thing that's very unique. When I was training as a nurse or a nurse practitioner, you better believe there was no concept of bioindividuality. Um, I talk a lot about that, that every woman probably needs to adjust and tweak based on their own needs. And that is okay. A lot of women want to be told every, this is what you need to do. This is what you do at this time. That's not the kind of book I wrote. I really want women to lean into their physiology, to stop apologizing for being women, to honor what is unique about our sex and our gender, 
and not apologize for it. Um, and, and so I think on a lot of levels, it's meeting the needs of women in a very unique way. And, uh, you know, dare I say, it's, it's a book that can be transformative. I, I really, I'm really proud of the book. Um, it was blood, sweat and tears, but here's the cool thing, Benny, that book started in my head back in 2019, because after that talk went viral, people were coming to me they wanted to be coached. They wanted to, you know, figure out intermittent fasting. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, it was like trial and error. Do I need a program that's 30 days or 45 days or 60 days? And so this is the best of what came out of, you know, trial and error for a couple of years. So it really was a unique opportunity. It's not like I wrote a book and then I had to figure out a plan. I already had the plan and it was really just creating the book around it. Okay, I want to go back a little bit. Um, you mentioned as women go through menopause, uh, the exercise will change. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to give you an anecdotal story. Um, Serena and I met uh, uh, mid 40s before our 45th birthdays. Um, and she was getting into at the time, she was running half marathons and getting into marathons. You know, she was right in that phase of her running. Uh, she was a non athlete her entire life and found running right around her, I guess her 40th birthday or something. I don't, I don't know, before I met her. And then she meets me and she hears about ultra cycling and hearing about it is one thing. And knowing that your boyfriend is going off on the weekends and he leaves at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and he seems to come in all salty and sweaty at 10 o'clock that night she doesn't see what went on all day long. Right? <laughs> but when I did I, the first race she came on uh, that I was doing was a 540 mile nonstop. So that <clears throat> that's going to take me to better part of 38 or so hours. And she's in the car. And uh, she sees we start at seven in the morning. And I'm pedaling and there's a car right behind me and seven o'clock in the evening comes and I'm pedaling and there's a car behind me. <laughs> and 10 o'clock that night is nice and dark and I'm pedaling and there's a car behind me. Um, and as she told me later, at some point around 11 o'clock, from watching me pedal all day, she was hypnotized in the back of the car and fell asleep. And it was a van. It was one of those big mm -hmm. Ford Econo vans. And she said she woke up at around 2 o'clock. And she didn't really realize where she was. And she goes, Oh, I'm, I'm in the van. I'm in. And she looked out of the front window, and I'm still pedaling. And then she went back to sleep for a while. She woke up and it was daybreak. And she looks out and I'm still pedaling. And instead of thinking I was crazy, she got intrigued by the whole thing. Right? Because the pedaling never stopped. Mm -hmm. Just kept going for 540 miles. And um, when it was over with, I took a shower and took a, a nap and woke up for dinner. You know, my crew was there and everything. You know, you get a quick nap after the thing is over. And we're sitting there and she goes, is there any form of this where people run for long distances? And I said, oh, yeah. That sport, ultra running, is way bigger than this sport. And by the way, the computer thing, you know, people weren't, you know, CrossFit wasn't even really a thing mm -hmm. back then. It was coming, it was all coming, you know, but people were running through mud, muddy buddies and all this crap and all this stuff. And I told her about ultra running and she just couldn't believe that she was trying to get to the marathon level and people were going 50, 75, 100 miles. And as soon as she got to the marathon level, she couldn't wait to go longer and bigger and further. And she met these other women women her age, women in their 50s doing the same thing. And she started running with them in the Santa Monica Mountains. Right. And she was still a sugar burner back then. And I started explaining to her, you don't have to eat sugar. You know how you get upset late in the day, your stomach gets upset when you're running. Don't have to. I got her onto the fat I got her onto. She would go out there running sometimes. Cynthia. I once I got her fat adapted. She would wake up in the morning, have a coffee with heavy cream in it and run 26, 28 miles in the mountains, oh my in gosh. the Santa Monica mountains, no food, no food, just fasted the whole time. The reason I bring all of this up was because at some point in her early 50s, she starts going through, you know, perimenopause and menopause. 
and that menopause, well, it drove me to drinking, but um, <laughs> it seemed to last forever. And um, but she got through it and she never stopped running. So in a weird way, it's almost counterintuitive to what you were saying. Running actually helped her mm -hmm. a great deal. Right. It got her through it. It was her drug. It's what got her through. Um, do you often see that with women or what, what are you what are you seeing out there? Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um you know, sarcopenia is a real thing. I mean, you obviously are familiar with that term muscle loss with aging. It's not a question of if, but when. And so I, I start to kind of entertain the conversation with women that it's more important to me that they lift weights and help to maintain lean muscle mass. So they become more insulin sensitive or maintain their insulin sensitivity. But I do find there is definitely a group of women that are not necessarily endurance athletes, because I think that is a unique subsect of, of our, our, you know, genetic pool, but I do have a lot of women that want to do chronic cardio. There's a woman at the gym, honest to God, doesn't matter what time my husband and I are there. She's on the, um, the stair stepper stair mill every single time I told my husband, I think she lives there because yeah. every time I'm there, it doesn't matter what time I'm there. She's on that damn step mill. And yeah. I almost, almost want to say to her, you would get more, much more bang for your buck if you would just pick up some dumbbells, even if you do body weight exercise. So I think there's definitely this misnomer. There's this misunderstanding that, you know, you have to run, you know, tempo runs all the time. You have to do the same thing day in and day out. Um, I like efficiency. And I think each one of us has to find what type of physical activity appeals to us. Um, I just, I have a question for you. So when I used to take cycling classes, I wore padded bike shorts right? and I would do these rigorous, you know, one hour and a half cycling classes. And when I first started doing it, my, you know, your rear end is sore. How I, I can just imagine there's a whole process with which you have to go through to build up your tolerance to sitting on a bike all day long. And I'm sure your listeners are probably thinking the same thing I do like that. That is, it's probably, you build, it's like building a muscle. You have to build up. Your it tolerance is, but, but you can't, you, first off, you can't build, you know, you won't build any callus down there. Um, <laughs> you know, that skin is too smooth and too soft. Yeah. And as you know, some of the smoothest muscles in your body are on your inner thigh and goes up through your perineum and the whole deal. Speaking of the perineum, um, with guys, uh, the, the two things I tell people when you buy a bike, the seat that's on your bike is probably not the one you're going to end up with. Neither is the next one or the one after that. Eventually, you will find a seat that will work. And I always tell them this. Clue, it won't be a soft seat. It will be, <laughs> it will be I use those old Brooks suspension saddles made of hard leather, you, you know, if you knock on it, it's like knocking on this desk, right? And they'll go, well, how do you what? It's like, well, first off, it's sitting right in the middle. If right. you have something soft, if you have this cushiony seat, even the ones that have the little divot cut out of the middle, which is nothing more than a marketing scheme. Um, what happens is that cushion wraps up around the muscle and blocks off the perineum. So you might notice that with a softer saddle, if you're a dude, your, your testicles and, and your, your penis is going to go numb way quicker than, you know, I can ride a Brooks saddle all day long. I never get numbness ever. The second thing is having that saddle fit, you know, you can tilt it up, tilt it back to where it's sitting for the lack of any other term, right on your, um, your sit bones, your right on the, it. right on the taint. Yep. Because bottom line, women are always sitting on their genitals, right? Yes, we yeah. are. Yeah. You guys, when you sit down, you're sitting on your genitals. Um, that's why we know you're tougher than us. <laughs> because we cannot stand that for one second. Um, but with women, that seat, I, I did bike fittings for years. And I would get more women. And they would explain to me, you know, I, I would say to them, listen, we got to get a bit personal. Where's the chafing happening? And they would tell me, and usually I would look at the pedals and look at, you know, I would measure the size of their leg, their, their femur and uh, the tibia and fibula, tibia and fibula. And I would go, oh, the problem is, is that you're reaching too much because of the pedal length. And because of that, 
if when you watch them from behind, like if they're facing that way, and I'm watching them from behind, their hips are going back and forth like this, which means right mm -hmm. on the iliac crest is doing that. It's like they're sanding the saddle, going Ouch. back and forth. Can you imagine doing that for 100 miles? No. You're, no. you're doing somewhere between 80 and 90 RPMs a minute. 100 miles can take you, if you're riding fast, five hours, right? You're sanding away on your ilium, you know, just boom, 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 boom. And all you have to do is fix the seat, shorten the crank length. And, you, and these people go, well, why didn't anyone else tell me that? It's like, well, they make bikes to fit the average person. If you're five foot two as a woman, I don't care which bike you bought. If those cranks are not the right length, you're going to have trouble. Number one. See, by the way, I don't know if you know this. My degree is in exercise physiology. Yes. I'll start nerding out. Um, <laughs> and this is all exercise physiologists do. We deal with, you know, how the body functions in different ways. And once you fix them, they'll go, you're a genius. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm just a guy that knows how to fit a bike, you know, and they now have computer programs doing this, but guess what the computer program doesn't have? It doesn't have human eyes watching the person. The computer doesn't have a plum that you can drop to see where everything is landing. The computer doesn't have all the gauges that we use in bike fitting, but that's usually why people have that hatchet in the back. You know, it feels like someone's got a hatchet right in yeah. the thoracic area. Um, they might get numbness on their hands. That's all curable with the correct bike position. And no one really understands that. Well, people that know how to fit bikes know, you know, but it's, you know, they will sell you anything. Oh, yeah, you look good on that bike. It's blue. Huh? It's great. It's great. <laughs> I don't know how I got off on that, but. No, no, because I asked the question. I was like, how do you sit on a bike for 500 miles? So that, it, that was it, where it, we got. It does hurt. Um, when you go that long, if you start feeling a hot spot at any point, you you know, I would use stuff like bag bomb and all that. You, you got to use more than regular chamois cream. You know, you have to use stuff that will allow the oozing to go back. I know it sounds awesome. Um, I can tell you a little turned on. Now. Yeah, I just pull out of axle grease down there and get that <laughs> like, all lubed up. Um, but yeah, that, that's how you do it. Um, and by the way, since you brought up spinning class, mm -hmm. One of the people, well, you know, what do you have against spinning class? The same thing I have against CrossFit. When you have people going at their aerobic capacity all the time in zone four, you're never giving them, even the guys, you take like a Lance Armstrong, who was number one, a genetic freak, and number two, a drug user. They never went that hard more than once a week, once they were trained up until they did the big races. And, you know, these people are going every day like your woman on the stair machine. They just go every day and they're hammering and hammering and hammering. And you want to talk about bruising your mitochondria and not building it up. And as we get older, all of our telomeres get shorter and shorter. Those little X's get shorter and shorter and they start to go away. We start to rust as human beings. And these people are working that harder and harder. It's almost like they're filing themselves down to nothing. What say you? No, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, that's why I talk about efficiency that to me, the most important things that I do include lifting weights, doing some interval training. Like I did hit today. I was doing, you know, it was one of those days. It was just busy. I didn't want to go to the gym. So I did some intervals on the treadmill where, you know, I crank it. I'm only five foot three. So 10 miles an hour sprints for me is pretty fast. Uh, you know, do that for 20 minutes and then, you know, walk a little bit, then I'm done, but it's flexibility work. It is, you know, some type of high intensity interval training one or two days a week and then strength training. And that to me is what I think is really key in helping for me to maintain where I am, but our bodies need different types of stress. If you, I always say monogamy is good, but if you're doing the same exercise, the same fasting schedule, the same nutrition plan every single day, you're not stressing your body in beneficial ways. You're just kind of, it's like, you're like a comfortable couch potato and we don't you want know. that. No, I tell everyone, you know, um, I, they'll go, why, why, do you, why do you still do what you do? It's like, because what else are we going to do? You know, we are at, um, we're almost at 90 days into this year. We're into the 13th week. I'm looking at, I still write everything down. As of today, right now, mm -hmm. I'm at 113 hours and 10 minutes of aerobics. 
Mm -hmm. And you go, well, why do, why do you write it down? It's like, because, you know, you have to keep track. You have to, you know, I make a goal. I have to do at least 365 hours of aerobics per year. And why not just keep track? Right. And you, I put other goals in there. You know, I, I have to do, I said, I have to finish another million meters on my rowing machine before May 1st. And now I have a small surgery coming up on the 25th of uh, April. So now that's been bumped up by six days, five days. <laughs> I'm not going to do it on surgery day. So six days, you know, but you know, unless you give yourself that stuff, I, as you can tell, there's a squat rack behind me, mm -hmm. there's dumbbells over here. There's everything I need to work out here in my house and I belong to a gym and you'll go, okay, it's a bit freaky. Then come on, it's too much. No, I like variety. Some days I don't want to be stuck in my office staring at a wall while I work out. I want to see other human beings while I work mm -hmm. out. Right. You know, I, I met a guy at the gym. I, I got a, a new guy friend, Matthew. That's awesome. Let's call him Matthew because that's his name. And I went over to his house for a drink the other night. I wouldn't have met the guy if I just worked out here, right? Mm -hmm. He's a guy my age, you know, we, we had a great time. And I'm going to invite him here. You know, it, it's, it's great when you go to the gym, you can see and you can do. You know, I like going outside. You know, the problem I have with CrossFit is the same problem I have with the spinning, where they have you going balls deep all the time, Right you can't keep doing that and stay healthy. And they'll go, well, I see these people in the CrossFit games. Yes, they're drug abusers. And I don't care who says they're not, they are. And they'll say, well, how do you know for sure? And it's like, well, for one, they caught the number two guy two years ago, one of the biggest heroes of CrossFit. You know, he didn't cycle his drugs correctly. They caught him. And I said, if you look at all these women from uh, Greenland and Iceland and everywhere else, you cannot work that hard and be that size as a woman. You can't. As a woman, you're not putting that much muscle on. You cannot do it without exogenous drugs. You cannot do it with, without exogenous hormones. Would you agree? I would agree. I mean, it's, it's very unusual. I was having a conversation about how testosterone is one example. Exo so exogenous, endogenous, excuse me. The testosterone our bodies make men and women both make testosterone, but testosterone is so much more potent in women. We don't need as much of it. But if you see women starting to take testosterone, they will start developing. And I'm talking about high doses, super physiologic doses. They will develop some masculine traits. They may, their voice may change. They may have some facial hair beyond which, you know, they, they might normally have, you may see significant muscle hypertrophy, but it doesn't look you know, women that, you know, and I'm thinking of the bot, the hardcore bodybuilders, the ones that are doing these big competitions and have huge muscles. I'm like, there's no question because there's this whole finesse of, you know, they'll, they'll build muscle up and then they're cutting, you know, they'll reduce their water. And this is certainly not my area of expertise, but from what I know, from what patients have shared with me, and it's always fascinating to me, you know, what people will try to do to tinker with their physiology. And I always say, if you're trying to outsmart mother nature, you're going to end up losing at some point. Just like the irony is men that use anabolic steroids at really high levels, what happens? They don't realize this, but they end up shrinking their genitals. So isn't that like a cruel twist of fate? Cynthia, it's even worse than that. Now, these guys, because of the internet and everyone trying to be famous on Instagram, these guys and women are dying left and right in their 20s. In their 20s, they're taking clenbuterol. They're taking Trin. These are drugs that are made for animals. I was about to say. The Trin and Clen. You know, uh, uh, you know, back in the, in, in the Arnold Schwarzenegger days, they took uh, 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 Diana Ball and, and um, some of these other steroids, right? And they would abuse those. They would have to take mm -hmm. enough to get that effect. These guys are taking stuff that you stacking. They stack. They call it gear. They try to make it sound good. These kids are dropping dead. I think there's like 29 or 30 professional bodybuilders this year. We're in the third month. I just said the 13th week dead already this year. And the trend is just continuing. They're just That's doing bad. more and more of it. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here. I got to do an ad. Uh, I want to come back and finish up with, I want to talk a little bit about the Dawn effect and what happens with people. It seems to be for when I can tell people who are 
way morbidly obese and they get into fasting. I hear it there a lot. And uh, I want to, we're going to finish off on exactly what's in the book. But folks, before we do that, I need to tell you about um, the best olive oil on the planet. Villa Capelli, the longest running sponsor of this show, Villa Capelli Olive Oil. I believe in this company so much that over at my company, purevitaminclub.com, we, not just us, but everyone has to hook a vitamin D3 to an oil. Most companies hook it to a seed oil because that's cheap. Um, but we hook it to an olive oil and not just any olive oil. I have barrels of it shipped to me from Villa Capelli. That is what we use in my products. That's how much I believe in this company and what they do. It's 100% olive oil, not like the stuff. Listen, folks, you can go to a grocery store in this country and they'll tell you that it's 100% pure, unadulterated olive oil, but it's 40% seed oil. They get away with that. The government allows them to do that. We have a wonderful government. Follow the signs. Um, but go check out what's going on at uh, Villa Capelli because I can vouch for it. 100% pure olive oil, and it tastes great. It's almost like a salad dressing all by itself. Just add a little salt, a little black pepper. Boom, you're ready to go. Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, will save you what? Oh, nothing. Just 10% every time. You want to have a double savings? Spend about 120 bucks. After the discount, you'll still be over 100 bucks. You will get free shipping. That's right, free shipping. Olive oil is heavy. It can cost a lot. Free shipping over $100 after the discount. And I tell people, get that three liter 10 because when you buy more of anything, it's cheaper. Three ways to save Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, V I N N I E, no wimpy Y. We are talking to the woman who wrote the book on fasting for women, Cynthia Thurlow. Cynthia, um, let's get into um, the Dawn effect. Explain what it is. Again, I'm in third grade. Explain what it is. Well, I mean, when you think about it at dawn, you know, our body is working to suppress melatonin, which is one of our sleep hormones and it's increasing cortisol. And so with this increase in cortisol, you'll see a resultant rise in blood sugar. And this usually occurs right around daybreak. Now, I, I agree with you that this can happen when patients are morbidly obese or insulin resistant, but I do sometimes actually see this in more metabolically healthy individuals. And so it can be a source of stress. And so I always recommend if you wake up in the morning and your blood sugar is over hundred, go for a five minute walk. We know that that can help with insulin sensitivity. And, and typically I think it's, it's more important when we're looking at blood sugar, um, regulation, we're looking at trends. If your blood sugar comes back down, you know, within an hour of, of waking up, I'm much less concerned about it, but the dawn phenomenon is a real thing. I saw a lot of it clinically, especially in the hospital, but if you're stressed and your cortisol's up even waking up in the morning as your, your body wakes up on its own cortisol is rising as an, in an effort to get you up and get you out of bed. And so resultantly with the rise in cortisol, you'll get a rise in blood sugar. And that's what you'll sometimes see on glucometers or CGMs, but even taking a five or 10 minute walk can help with insulin sensitivity and bring that back down. The book is called intermittent fasting transformation. I think it says it right there in the title. You get what it is. <laughs> Um, where can they find it, Cynthia? Yeah, so we are selling it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, or your local bookstore. The really cool thing is that um, I've been able to find it in books a million. Every time I go somewhere new, I'm, I'm looking to make sure it's out uh, or you know patronize your local bookstore. I think local bookstores have really had a hard time over the past two years. So I like to keep it local if at all possible. If you are shopping on Amazon, if you go to vinnytotterich.com, it will be in the Vinny Totterich book club and it's going to be front and center by the time this podcast comes out. Uh, this, this podcast, I think, is two weeks out. Okay. Uh, I'm going to see if I can push it to. Mm, I'll, I'll try to get it out this Friday, but I, I know what they're going to tell me. <laughs> I, I don't I don't boss my people. They boss me. I um, hear you. Yeah, that's how it works. So um, folks, you can go to vinnytotteries.com. It will be in the book club there. Uh, speaking of vinnytotteries.com, uh, go there before you go to Amazon. Uh, click through, bookmark it, use it every time. It puts a little coal on the fire and it gets my train down the track. 
I'm able to keep this show free. We're, folks, we're almost at 2100 episodes. And we've kept it free this entire time. Because of you helping us out by going to any before you go to Amazon. We also have the super fan page, you can go to any toss us a couple of bucks. It's kind of like PBS. You know, we're, we're just run by you guys. And as I tell everyone, I don't do this podcast for a living. That money does not end up in my pocket. It ends up in Anna's pocket, Gina's pocket, Megan's pocket, Bill, Tallulah, everyone, Debbie, everyone who works here gets a salary from this podcast, except moi. And that's uh, Mexican for me. Um, so go <laughs> check that out. Uh, Cynthia, any final words before um, we let you go? No, I, I always enjoy our conversations and uh, look forward to the next time we we get together and catch up. You are invited back anytime you want to come back on. I'm going to turn this off for the rest of the podcast, but 